Okay, conflict is no, nobody has a monopoly on conflict. Uh, not a good solution. You're going to have to work with people whom you will not totally respect and who will not totally respect you. You will also have to accept that respect can be a product of communication rather than a prerequisite. Why do we talk across cultures? Surely partly to create respect and trust and understanding. You cannot assume that there's a bliss of bad people and we're not going to talk with them or translate them. And you cannot assume to solve any problem that way. You know what I'm talking about. Good. You might know who I'm talking about as well. But, yeah. My final bad solution is um, that intervention is a question of opposing narratives. And I think uh, David in his talk will pick up on some of the narratives I'm talking about. Um, I've noticed it in your, uh, in your abstract. Yes. <laughs> um, th this is... I, I won't go into, in, in, into it in, in, in great detail, but it, uh, the problem here is that there's a kind of ideological closure. It, it posits that the, the conflict at stake is one of ontological narratives that are mutually exclusory, um, so that we will not work or, or we will alter the text of a certain person because, and I cite, they are the sort of person who or don't go along with that sort of translation theory because the meta-narrative of that theory is that you will make these decisions and get rich and die happy. Um, a narrative in its nature has ideological closure and exclusion. A narrative in its nature excludes some very important parts of cross-cultural communication, notably dialogue and exchange and openness to the unknown, that part of the other that is unknown, that is not incorporated in the narrative one possesses. Which leads me to my solution. Oh, there's one more bad argument, I'm sorry. Look at time. In, in this area, um, there are no human rights. In fact, there are no rights at all. There is no such thing as a right to information, or a right to a decent pay, or a right to good work conditions, or a right to embellish the text, or a right to be free of foreign intervention, or any right at all. Because the whole discourse of human rights has been well and truly shown to be a Western imperialist imposition. In the first place, uh, through Asian right to development and read, read the literature on from there, okay? <laughs> I, I think uh, that's, we, we don't have a lot of people talking about rights. It tends to be there as, as, as it's sort of assumed that there is a right to something. But if you're serious about cross-cultural ethics, you cannot assume any rights. You have to move back to a Quentin Skinner Machiavellian frame. There are no rights. If there are, great. But I've no, no proof of any rights this week. Instead of rights, we just have interests which are conflicting and competing, but can cooperate. Why do people communicate across cultures? The only possible reason is to find mutual benefits, to find situations of cooperation, to find win-win situations. It's Adam Smith, you can find it there. I don't have to elaborate on the theory of cooperation, I hope, but it's the only way that you can think through these false solutions. Find an aim in cross-cultural communication that can lead to cooperation and if you've got that one, intervene. I will now solve the problem of the peace map intervention. My uh, former student, Ahmad Ayad, who did this, when he first did this research, he was shocked that there were so many interventions going on. How could translators possibly do this and still be called translators? And that happens. Uh, they're not translators, problem solved, but come on, let's get real. They got paid for the job. That was... How could they do this? And he assumed, when he went into the text analysis part, that he was working with legal texts. He said, you know, 
well, if you're translating a contract, you can't change those things. We got back and started to think, well, wait a minute, these are not legal texts. What is this text? What is this roadmap? What is its function? What, what's it doing out in the world? It's a text as, that has to work as a basis for conversation, for dialogue, for future exchange. It's a point of departure. It's not a fixed text. And any intervention, the, most of the articles were added in a Palestinian newspaper, likely to get popular support for this initiative in the time the translation was carried out. If that aim is laudable, if that translation can get large segments of the population engaged in an act of cross-cultural communication like the Roadmap for Peace or any other peace initiative or any other act of cooperation, then it is ethically laudable in that situation for that purpose. I have now justified ethical intervention. I now have to write it up as a code of ethics, but <laughs> I'm sure you're much better at me than that. My final uh, comment is this. I, I, I'm trying to do work on... Boundary work is a really nice term. I think we should use more of that. The boundary work here affects the translation in, in many ways, um, but by shifting the ethical discussion to that level, I have to allow that there are many, many kinds of cross-cultural communication and many different things that mediators can do. And one of the, the, the consequences of my thought is that I've come to see that what we have to train are not actually just translators and just interpreters. We have to train people who can think critically about the situations in which they have to intervene. We have to train people who are going to be mediators in a broader sense. That will be, will be unpopular with official ideologies, but it sort of ensues from the mode of thought that I've presented. That's one kind of boundary change that we might go for or might not. The second affects our own status within the academic discipline called translation studies. A lot of the best thought that I find in theories comes from what is badly and loosely called cultural translation. We have, in English language translation studies at least, an ongoing perplexity with a, a number of theorists who talk about translation in a sense that has nothing to do with texts. Migration is translation. The interpretation of the past is translation. The handing on of cultural heritage is translation. Museums are translation. Anthropology is translation, etc. Cultural translation sort of brings together all those things. And I've been debating with myself about what to do with that new sense of the term translation. And I've published texts that say I don't like the metaphors. I like to have a relationship with a profession. I like to be training people to go out and, and produce texts. And I don't want to abandon that. But that's the place that the most insightful theory and helpful theory for this kind of intervention is being developed. And to that extent, I am starting to open up my own boundaries within the discipline. Thank you very much. <laughs>